Hey everyone, this is Daryl Evans. I am the creator of the Lean Marketing Plan. I am the host of the MindShift Podcast, and I'm the CEO of a digital marketing agency called Yoko Local. And in this episode of the Business Growth Architect Show, I'm going to share with you some strategies that are key to growing your business faster using a marketing strategy called the Lean Marketing Plan. I'm also going to share with you how to avoid or ways that I've used to avoid the bright, shiny object syndrome. And I also want to share with you a concept that has been extremely powerful in building successful teams, and it's called my superstar DNA process. Hello, fabulous person. Beata Shalet here, the growth architect. Welcome back to the Business Growth Architect Show, where we bring you cutting edge business strategies from some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, business transformation experts, and visionaries who want to help you to scale your impact. Look for one tangible strategy that you can take back and implement right away. And now back to our guest. Welcome back, Beata Gillette here, the host of the Business Growth Architect Show. And today we are going lean. We are going into cutting the fat. We're talking about shiny objects, squirrel syndromes, and all the stuff that entrepreneurs often do wrong, overcomplicating things, going too much into details, doing things we don't love about. And on the show with me today is Daryl Evans, who will help you to slay through everything that is not necessary. Daryl, I'm so excited for you to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Let's have a, a great conversation and hopefully trim some fat on <laughs> some of the listeners' plate. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like we were immediately getting into the pre-conversation and, and then I said, we better hit the record button so we get some of this good stuff on the show. So Daryl, somebody who doesn't know who you are, tell them who you are and what you do. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So Daryl Evans, uh, been an entrepreneur since I was uh, 20 years old, off and on. Got really serious and took the plunge where I looked no, no longer again at corporate America around the age of 30. And since then, I've uh, had a few successful businesses. And um, currently in the last 12 years, we've had a digital marketing agency uh, helping small and mid-sized uh, companies uh, grow revenue online, all the channels that everybody is, uh, I'm sure, to know about. And uh, other than that, I'm a father, grandfather of four, and I'm based here out of Las Vegas, Nevada. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. So you talk a lot about a superstar DNA and unique a capability. And I kind of want to start with that a little bit to set the context of the way you break it down for your clients to dive into what's really important in life. Do you mind sharing with us a little bit what is a superstar DNA? Yeah, superstar DNA. Uh, <laughs> DNA is what everybody asks me about. It's uh, not the biological DNA. It's uh, what I call definite natural ability. And it's something that I believe, and I think most people agree, that each of us have. We have some God-given gift or uh, something we were born with innately that's unique to us. And I think part of the journey of growth <laughs> funny, we're on the uh, growth, <laughs> growth architect. architect show. Yeah. Right. Part of this process of growth in life, right. Is understanding what is our core gift, not just what our calling is, not just what our mission or purpose is, but what are we uniquely designed to do? And I learned it some of, somewhat the hard way, um, uh, enforcing myself to do certain things earlier in my career, where I felt like I had to do more than I needed to do without recognizing that there was someone else more uh, appropriately equipped through their natural ability to assist me or assist our team or our company, our product or service. And once I started understanding that true understanding of uh, definite natural ability, not just in myself, but in others, it allowed me to make better decisions as an entrepreneur, building teams, assigning work, as well as uh, taking on customers. Is that the prerequisite to scaling to understand that part? I think it's one of them. I think it's super important to understand uh, you can't scale without a team. I mean, I guess there are certain businesses where you can grow a business if you're just a digital business and you're writing online or something of that nature. Certainly, you could be an affiliate marketer and scale that up pretty well. But I think if you're going to grow a business that has um, the way I define the business is if you grow a business that's going to run without you, operate without you, and as Jeff Bezos would say, you could leave for a year and it's better the year after you get back than the year if you'd have stayed, I think is some, somehow how he said it. That's a different perspective of thinking. 
right? If you left the business for a year and came back and it was better than when you left it, it's going to require people, talent, processes, and systems, as you know. And so it does, even if you're a smaller entrepreneur, small to mid-sized company, or even a solopreneur working with a virtual assistant or just someone part-time, I think it's a really important um, aspect to get some of your life back, get some of your freedom back. So you're not always having your hands in all the, the fires in the business. So now we're diving into some of these things. I think everybody really needs to hear here today because there is so much in this aspect of, I work hard because I have to work hard. I am the only one who can do it. I am the best one at everything in my business. I cannot scale unless I give things to other people, but they're not as good as I am. Uh, I am doing too many things. Why can't I mini clone me? You know, I call them the cloning of the mini me's. So how do we help our listener today to untangle this a little bit? Because you are really big on the discipline that it requires to build your own business model. So can you help us navigate the exaggerated self-esteem and ego of an entrepreneur founder until they become the business owner they can step away? How do we build that model, Daryl? Well, it's a big question, but I do. You have like two minutes. <laughs> I know, I know. So <laughs> let me tell you how to begin, because I think of it always this way. The first thing that we have to do is to decide that that's the kind of business that we want. See, we have to decide first, like nothing happens until a decision is made. And once we set a goal or an intention or a desire, we have to be committed to that decision until and unless you're committed to building a team that has staff team and operations that runs without hundred percent of your input, then you won't get anywhere, right? How did I learn that? Well, I tried the first few years hiring someone not, not the way I understand it now, but I failed a few times hiring people in my smaller entrepreneurial enterprise when I first started and it didn't work because I didn't have clarity. So number one, make a decision. Number two, you got to get clarity. You got to get clarity on what it exactly takes to deliver the work that you do, what it takes to acquire a customer, what it takes to onboard that customer, what it takes to deliver to that customer. So the exercise is to carve out some time and pull out a journal and open up and jot down everything that happens in your business, the most minute, the, the big items, the small items, the in-between items, so that we can actually get clear on what in fact <laughs> happens to deliver our product or service or um, you know, to a, to a customer. And from there, I want you to then say, you go down and make a checklist on everything that makes your head hurt when you see it on your calendar. When you're assigned to do it in your project management system, in your calendar, in your notes, or in your reminders, when it shows up, what makes your head hurt, metaphorically speaking? But there's something you'll feel it. You'll feel tension in your shoulders, in your neck, in your head. You'll feel it in your body. What, what is it that you're doing that causes you tension? That instantly lets you know you're operating outside of your your unique DNA. It doesn't mean. And here's the problem uh, that we face yet. We always believe we can figure it out, right? The very trait that makes us strong leaders and entrepreneurs is in the absence of knowledge, we'll go figure it out. And of course, today we have the world's internet of Google and of course, all the new chat AIs and all the things that are happening. The problem though is, should you be figuring it out, right? And it's having clarity to know what it is but then understanding, okay, there's probably someone else more suited than this. Should I be sitting down trying to figure out how to code my website? Not really, probably. So th that's kind of the first couple of steps. Decide, get clear, and then figure out what it is that actually causes you tension in your body. Look for that feeling in your body. Then you'll start to be able to digress. Okay, if I can only hire one person, these are the things that they should be doing because I feel good about these. I feel terrible about these. And it's simple, but it matters. It is so funny that you say that, should you code the website? Because a year ago when I hired my um, irreplaceable now a virtual assistant out of the Philippines, she caught me having gone on the back end of my website and made some changes. And I remember 
the call. And she was very stern. And she says, did you go in the back end and work on the website yesterday? I said, yeah, yeah, I did. She says, why? I didn't really have an answer for that because yep. I guess I could because I wanted to, because it popped in my mind. I saw something that needed to be fixed. It was easier for me to just do it versus putting it in the project management software and assigning it. And then, you know, I would have had to write the thing and then I would have gone to the writer and that would have to be proved that would have to gone to the website guy. And then, you know, and I'm like, I'm just going to do it. She says, you know, you cannot do this anymore. That's what you have me for. And she was very yeah. adamant about it. So she really helped me to identify some of these things. Why is it that we get so easily caught into the, I can just do this by myself? Is it because we've always done it ourselves and it's just a habit and we're not conscious of it? Or do we suffer from some sort of grandeur personality disorder? I'm laughing over here because as you told that story about the website, I remember when my executive assistant uh, was evaluating, she joined us a couple of years ago. She was evaluating my workflow throughout the week. And she didn't say it in these words, but this was the tone. This was the look on her face. And it was, uh, it had to do with my podcast. And she goes, why are you doing that? And because basically, you know, as entrepreneurs, we, we want to be good with our money. We want to be frugal. We want to be conservers of capital because we don't know when the rainy day is going to hit, but sometimes we can take that too far. And she literally was just about like, you're an idiot. You know that, right? I like, kind of felt like an idiot after that conversation, if I'm really Yeah, she, she did it to me. And I was like, and obviously I hired a podcast producer right after that. Um, but I think the good part about that is when you hire the right person, they will actually confront you on your BS story that you're telling yourself. And as entrepreneurs, let me get back to your question. I think it's a combination of speed, commitment. Like we are committed to the outcome because we own the thing. And sometimes we believe that if we take time to go get the person who's a freelancer or whatever, first of all, there's a time delay if you don't already have that person around. And sometimes we're worried about, oh, let me just go ahead and get it done. I can learn it faster and get it out of the way, blah, blah, blah. So there's a little bit of speed. I know that in my world, sometimes I'm like, let me just get it done. It actually happened two hours ago this day. Customer Gasp. had a problem with- Gasp, no. <laughs> it just happened to- Customer had a problem with their Google Tag Manager on our ad camp, one of our ad campaigns, sent in a ticket. I knew our de developer was tied up for a little while. And my mind knew how to solve it. And I just about did it. And then I said, you know what? He doesn't learn if I do it. So I shot him a Loom video. And I, and yet I'm telling you, I had it in front of me and I could have finished it. And instead- <laughs> And your, finger, your finger was hovering over the, over the enter button. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I stopped and shot him a loom video because he doesn't learn yeah. how to resolve this if I do it for him. And so that's the discipline of this idea. And that is, is there going to be any damage to the customer if I let it happen tomorrow by putting it in the project system, shooting him the loom video and letting him fix the problem? That's, that's the part of it. So I have to, as hard as it is, and right now, yeah, you know, uh, transition of our agency, I bought partner out and uh, we've been transitioning a lot, a lot of new team members. I'm having to go through a lot of this, allowing six new people on my team to, to develop that DNA in our process, mm -hmm. whereas I want it to happen now. And so there's a lot of patience that's required. You do have to let them make mistakes. You have to guide them. You have to coach them, but you got to give them room. Otherwise you're right back in the overwhelm of it all. And so there's a series of months or longer where you just have to let this play itself out, but stay committed to the end result. I love that. There's a, there's a discipline and in the transition, I mean, what happens is that the agility of the business itself, right? Starts to slow down a little bit because when you're the only person who does it, you know, whatever you focus on gets done immediately. So you train your customer to expect that from you. And that causes your burnout because then if you pick up the phone, like you famously had said, um, you know, people were just shooting you, um, leaving your messages 
when you were in the real estate business at three o'clock in the morning, because they knew that they wanted the message to be there first thing in the morning. And you hated that because it, it, it created an expectation that was not the way you wanted to run the business. So is this so discipline is discipline the only thing we have to have as a as a mindset piece or is there are there other elements and is it like do we have to have trust in the people do we have trust in our own decisions what what else yeah. goes into that uh, you nailed it right i mean in order for us to build a team small or large doesn't matter what size organization you know there's a lot of talk about systems and processes but I just believe that if it starts with that, here's the list of things that have to happen every day, every week to deliver to our clients, to acquire a customer, to service them at a high level, then let's get clear on what it is that happens in the business. Like what is your, how we do it here model? Meaning how does that work today with you doing it? If you're a solopreneur and then in that case, great. Now I'm going to start to bring someone in or other people in the other thing that's necessary besides the discipline to get clear and then decide is to have trust in and have a process for hiring talent and building the right attraction mechanism, right? The, I think that the job of a job description is to attract as well as to repel. And it's a skill that I've built over a lot of, a lot of years, which is to write a job description, not just on the things we need done, but the type of person we want to do them. So in job descriptions, I've developed a way of in the top paragraph or two, before they get into the required skills and the job duties, which is what you typically see, we try to write a couple of lines of what the ideal person would look like who would be in this role. Meaning we'd say something like, you know, the ideal person for this role would be a self-starter, okay. be able to work with, you know, little supervision, be guided by um, growth and development. I mean, I'm making things up on the fly here, but we're trying to attract as well as de, you know, repel the bad, the, the wrong applicants. But then I've also realized that no matter how good you do with your job description, no matter how well you are at answering, uh, asking questions in an interview, which my first interview is probably one of my best. It's probably my best piece of advice. I give people the first interview is not about the job, the role, the descriptions. It's about culture fit. And there are five questions I'm almost always asking in that first interview because the resume got them to the interview. But I want to know first and foremost, do they fit our culture? I can train them on everything else if they're not perfect for the skill. But if they're the wrong fit for the group that we have, then I use that for the first interview. But I also use a backup tool, which is if I ever have multiple candidates that seem like they're the right fit, I use a tool called Colby, Colby A Index. And I love it. And I love it for this reason. And it's because the way it was described to me when I first found out about it, which would be 20, 19 years ago now, unlike DISC or, or some of the other personality assessments, it determines a person's natural mode of operation in a given situation. Example, if I want someone to be a salesperson for me, but they have a natural, um, they don't have a natural instinct for that, Colby can tell us that if I need someone who's operationally organizing operational manager, operations manager, project manager, there are certain things that need to show up on the Colby that tells me they have that natural instinct. There's too many people that want to learn how to do something, but then they realize, oh gosh, this makes my head hurt. So they just want to take a job because they need one. So I've learned over the years uh, to combine uh, a series of interviews. And if I'm really not sure. I use the Colby index to see if their natural DNA fits what I know the role to need. Uh, yeah, we, we, we use Myers-Briggs and I'm certified in Myers-Briggs. Um, nice. There's nothing that happens without uh, even my, my, my clients. I got to know, I got to know who my people are and right. not, not just from the perspective of who they are, but also from how I need to show up for them so that I can give them the information in in the way that they are able to understand that so i want to move over to the lean marketing plan which we'll talk about right after this message thank you so much for listening to the show this is beate the growth architect i'm so excited that you're here thank you so much for your time 
Have you ever wondered why your business is not growing as quickly as you would like it to be? Well, you may have a business growth blocker. And if you'd like to find out what that business growth blocker is, go and take our brand new quiz at growthblockerquiz.com. And in only a few minutes, you're not just going to find out what that blocker is, but also what to do about it. Again, go to growthblockerquiz.com. And now back to the show. And welcome back. Beata Shalette here with Daryl Evans talking about all things about being disciplined and building your business and kind of cutting the fat and getting very clear on how you want to set up your business model. Uh, so Daryl, you have something that is the lean marketing plan, which is, you know, if I'm really honest with you, because I have a thing that's called denitricizing. So I work with a lot of people that have like lots of, lots of ideas and I help them in my signature growth system and my strategies to put it all under one umbrella. Lean marketing plan is the exact opposite of that. So shall we dive into that? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Sure. So the lean marketing plan, um, if you can think about it, lean, if you think about the uh, idea of lean, it means skinny, thin, without fat, leaner than others, right? I came up with the concept from a standpoint of having started a number of businesses with less than adequate capital resources, right? So a lot of businesses, and by the way, this doesn't just work if you're starting a business from the trunk of your car, like I was when I was in college or even after a financial situation happened and I was kind of financially devastated and I was living on my grandmother's couch. Um, I'm not talking about just that thought process, but a lean marketing plan has a back to the conversation of focus. It has an ability to get, a, get us focused on one type of customer that we can sell our product or service to, not the three or four or five different buyer personas in the world. In my world, we'll ask, who's your ideal customer? And it starts with everyone who fill in the blank, wrong answer. No, no, no. Who's the one customer we can sell to today? Number two, what is the one pathway? Sorry. What is the one problem that we can solve for this customer? That's a, an emergency for them or one that they want to solve and B one that they want to solve now, not later. So we try to identify what's the primary problem that we can get in front of solving for them. Number three, how do they go about the process of discovering a solution to that problem once they have it? Okay. So one buyer, one problem, one pathway, what pathway can we insert our marketing into insert your brand in front of, so we can maybe intercept them when they're on their journey. Why is it important for us to intercept them? Because they have the desire to solve the problem. It's not a sale when you offer a solution to someone who's hungry. If I'm hungry, you show up with a steak, I'm going to eat, right? So we try to use that methodology. The next thing is, let's describe one offer or one invitation that we can use for this person who has a problem, who went on a pathway. What can we offer them that would be hopefully a no-brainer decision for them to take a step into your world so they would get one step closer to them solving the problem with you. The last piece to this is the one product, the one product. Everybody has multiple products. Everybody has multiple services. You can't sell them everything at the same time, right? What's the one product offer that we're going to sell them? And that's sort of the basics of the playbook. Um, oftentimes we take companies that have already done well, and we say, listen, let's reverse engineer and start your next level of growth with this sort of recipe and let's dig into your world. We can do it with startups. We can do it with companies that are seasoned. Um, so it's a baseline way for us to get to results quicker by being narrowly focused on one of those five categories, or I mean, I'm sorry, all of those five categories. And we get a lot of pushback. Sometimes we get a lot of resistance, but, 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 but yet I've got this person who buy, uh, but, but, but I've got this, I, I get it. I get it. But you said you wanted results. You said you want to go to the next level. Let's carve out a piece of this and let's be focused for the next 60, 90, 120, 180 days so we can make sure that what we're doing strategically is working. Then we can layer on. I, I just had a meeting. I can't say the name of the company. Um, 
and it's it's just scattered. Too many chiefs in the in the kitchen, too many cooks in the kitchen, as they say. It, it's it's really frustrating. It's it's frustrating for our team strategically to map it out because all they want to do is execute these tactics, 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 tactics. What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? No plan. Uh, I'm a little bit more of a planner. I, I went to school to be an engineer. I ended up changing to become uh, to get a degree in finance. So my mind kind of works procedurally, process driven. I like hypothesis, strategy, plan of action, execution, repeat. Right. <laughs> and so but even you just, don't like just tactics. You need to have a little bit more meat on the bone. Of course, because tactics before, you know, the book, The Art of War, tactics before strategy is the noise Pointless. before defeat. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the, the problem with the world today digitally is there's so many, everybody can execute the tactics for free. Everybody can open a Facebook account, a Google account, open up a blog, start blogging, send an email account. All this stuff is free. It's all wonderful. It's all beautiful. It's all great, except there's no strategy. The number one, there's four reasons people hire our, our agency. Out of the four, the number one reason is they lack a clear strategy. Number two is they lack the skills. Number three, they lack the time to execute it, even if they have the skill, which is why most companies hire our agency. And number four is because they don't, they can't figure out how to get the ROI equation to map out. That those are the four ideal problems they want to solve. Yeah, they say it's on Facebook ads, Google ads, email. Those are the tactics. But the four problems: strategy, time, skill. And they can't figure out the profit margin, the, the profit equation. So once we figure out that, that's what the lean, pro, uh, lean pro, uh, marketing plan addresses so that we can get number one to the profit. But number two, we can figure out the right strategy and help them collapse time and skill. So it's, it's just something I've developed now 20 years. This was before the internet actually kind of took off. I used to do this in my offline work and it just mapped perfectly to what we think of now as the buyer's journey online. Yeah, I mean, I think it works actually really well, even in my system with, you know, the denitricizing, because in 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 a good signature growth system, you have individual pieces, and each one of these individual pieces should be very clearly defined. So um, what you're talking about is the definition of what it is, that thing, what that thing is, and then you know, eventually how that thing connects to the other things. Shall you decide to do more things? That is the cohesiveness that a business right. needs to have to be believable uh, to uh, to the outside. So we cannot say I sell to, to women in their 20s, uh, men in their 60s, uh, families with two small children, even though technically you know, everybody could always buy something. There's exceptions, but there's a very specific language that you want to hone in that talks specifically to the one person you want to attract because correct me if I'm wrong, but you also have experience and that's how I want to close the show with you. You also have experience with the burnout and the business owning you. So unless you do that, what danger am I going to run into? You nailed it. I've been burnt out more times than I would like to imagine. I don't think that any entrepreneur is immune to it, even those that those that build businesses that run without them. Because, I, by the way, clear full disclaimer, uh, I've gone through a season of burnout the last six months. I've had to retool, restructure my company after a company ownership transition and some turnover. And you run the risk of burning out anytime you go through change. I mean, look, we have economic issues. We've had pandemic, we've had inflation, we've had supply chain. There's been enough these last several years uh, to, to burn a lot of entrepreneurs out. That being said, um, you want to, to avoid burnout, or should I say, to reduce the risk of it. Uh, it really comes with intention. What do I mean by that? Intention on how you run your day intention on when you take meetings, intention on when you don't take meetings, intention on when you give yourself time for self-care, intention on when you spend time with your family. On my calendar, if someone opened my calendar, they would look at it and say, my goodness, you're super busy. But what they won't see, or if they look closer, they'll see that my workout time is scheduled, my meditation and personal time in the morning is scheduled, my dinner time with my family is scheduled. I'm on a charity that happens tonight. That's on my schedule. 
I do have client meetings and team meetings and hiring and scheduling and all the things, but I use the schedule to tell me what to do and what not to do. And it also means it tells me when to take a break just before this call, just before I was uh, going to get on with you and have this great conversation. It told me to take time for lunch. How often do entrepreneurs say, I've been, eat I've been running all day, haven't eaten lunch. Well, schedule it <laughs> and then honor the daggum schedule. Right. So this is what I do in my business. Sometimes it's like, look, just honor the schedule. If I look at your schedule and you tell me you're overwhelmed and I don't see all your stuff scheduled, I know where the problem is. It's the fact that the schedule's running you, you're not running it. And the minute we start the day, if we start running other people's agenda before our own, we end up in burnout. When I burn out, it's because I'm overzealous about time deadlines and I run myself through it for a while. I rarely have situations today burn me out. I, because of my desire to achieve, my desire to operate at a, at a high level of speed and performance, sometimes I can take myself too far. But I rarely have, like I told you in our call a few months ago when we first get, got introduced, I don't have what I had 10 years ago, 12 years ago, where people were calling me all hours of the day. I am just an overachiever sometimes, and I have to sometimes pump my own brakes. Yeah, I, I, I second that. I think the further along we go in our professional development and career, the more we recognize that the mindset and the inner aspects are so connected to the outcomes that we achieve. And when we are younger, we believe that it's the hustle that achieves the outcome. And so to bring that into balance at some point is really a lifelong ministry, if you so want to, for 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 everyone, right, Daryl? Hundred percent. I'm yes. forty I'm fifty two this year. And I have continued to evolve. And here's the thing, when you achieve, it's funny how you don't want to stop achieving. You may get it done right here. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden something else uh, catches your, your attention. And all of a sudden you're starting else, starting something else new. Um, but I think it is a lifelong a pursuit. I think it is a constant state of awareness. And I think self-awareness is a key to being a successful entrepreneur long time, long term because you have to be able to be mindful of not only priorities, but when things are getting a little bit out of whack, I know when things are out of whack and I know how to take a break. You know, in the pandemic, I started working from home. We had an office in our, in our, uh, with our agency for, uh, 10 of the 12 years we've been around pandemic. Obviously we shut it down. We decided not to go back. Now I have a 100% virtual staff, which, and not all, not, uh, there's only one of them in the same city that I even live in anymore. That's been a new development of managing a 100% virtual team. We always had some virtual, but now 100% virtual team, most of which are not even in my neighborhood or in my city, that's taken on a new level of learning. So it is a constant growth period uh, that you have to go through and a constant ability to be self-aware. And it's real work. It's worth the work, but it has to be intentional work. And you have to be able to work on that in whatever facet that is for you. Maybe it's going to conferences, seminars, getting a coach, um, you know, or, you know, self-study, but it, it's a little bit of all of that, I think, in the long run. Wonderful. Well, what a great way to end this interview. Daryl, um, how can we find out more about you and learn what you do and participate uh, being around your sphere? Uh, probably the easiest way is right where you're listening to the Growth Architect show. You can look for the Mind Shift podcast, which is a show that I host, and we are uh, three and a half years in. It's been a wonderful opportunity to sit down and meet wonderful entrepreneurs uh, like Viet. Hopefully, I can have you on my show. Uh, but right where you're listening to the Growth Architect show, look up the Mind Shift podcast with Daryl Evans, and you can connect with me there, and that'll lead you to all the other places online that I hang out. Wonderful. Yes. And thank you so much. It's been really amazing. This went a little longer than I usually go, but I, I was so into the conversation that I really wanted to extract every piece of lean wisdom out of you. So thank you so much for doing this for us, Daryl. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super grateful that you uh, hold space for this conversation. Thank you. And that's it for us today. Thank you so much for listening and watching to the Business Growth Architect Show. And I'm your host, Beat Chalette. 
And that's it for us today. Thank you for listening and watching the Business Growth Architect Show. I enjoyed having you here. And for accountability, just take one of the strategies that you have heard, one thing that you can implement in your business immediately. Please leave comments. Don't forget to like and share this show. And if you have any questions about business, please put them in the comments. We are here for you. We're here to support you and help you to grow, build, and scale your own business. For more advice, please check out our website in the show notes below. Thank you again. This is Beata Shillette, the Growth Architect, and goodbye.